Hello friends, and welcome to my second ever monthly video wrap-up thing. I've already done this once, but I found out that my mic wasn't plugged in, so here we are. I've got 12 books to talk about today, some of which have already been featured in their own videos, some you can find in articles on our website, and one I didn't finish at all. So, 12 books is quite a lot to get through, let's just jump in. Hi, how are you? Hope you're doing well. You look great. Let's talk about some books. First up is a book that I haven't featured at all anywhere. It's not in a video, it's not on our website, but it is a book that I thoroughly enjoyed when I read it about a month ago while I was visiting my parents. I took this book with me and devoured it over a few days, and it is called Sister Song by Lucy Holland. It's a piece of historical fiction that is set during medieval, middle ages, dark ages Britain. It's a time that we don't know much about historically because there weren't that many written records about it, but there was this folk song from the time period about two sisters. In this book, there are three siblings. It's a twist on a folk song that I don't know much about. All I really know is what was written in this novel. And it takes place, as I said, during the Dark Ages of Britain, during a Saxon invasion of Britain. And it tells the story of the three children of King Cador. I was really into this because it's a blend of historical fiction and fantasy, two of the genres that I love the most. I love fantasy novels, especially ones that are set in a kind of medieval European setting, which a lot of fantasy novels are, and I love historical fiction more and more as the months and years go on, and so this was written for me, it felt like. Even more so because one of the three siblings in this book is a trans man. And this is fantastic for a number of reasons. One, trans representation, fantastic. Two, trans representation in genre fiction, really great to see. And three, not proof, but an example of the fact that trans people have always existed, have always been here. So I was absolutely thrilled. I'm not gonna tell you much more about it because I don't have time, I've gotta get through a lot of books, but I really recommend Sister Song. It's a fantastic book. If you're in the UK, Go to a Waterstones and you'll see it on a table. It's everywhere at the moment and I'm thrilled that it is. Trans representation, historical fiction, fantasy, woohoo, it's brilliant. Next up is Piranesi. I have done a video on Piranesi. I went nuts over this book in that video. I went nuts over it when I read it. I loved this book. I could have read it a year earlier and just didn't, even though I am a big, big fan of Susanna Clarke. I was just a bit stupid. And this book is even better than I hoped it would be. It's even better than the hype. It is the most I have enjoyed a book this year, period. I loved Piranesi. If you haven't read it yet, it's on the shortlist for the Women's Prize. Oh, just don't waste your time like I did. Just go read Piranesi. It's fantastic. This is a book that I got a review copy for, and I was particularly excited about this because we don't really get review copies of popular fantasy novels. A lot of review copies we get are from small indie presses and translated fiction. And of course, indie presses, queer fiction, translated fiction, these are our wheelhouse and great, I will always support indie presses, I will always support translated fiction, but it was cool to get a big fantasy book through the door because it just doesn't happen. And Shadow of the Gods turned out to be a really, really fun book. I'd had my eye on the author John Gwynne for a long, long time, and I hadn't picked up his books because I'm too busy. And so Review Copy gives me a reason to finally read him, and this is a Viking Norse mythology-inspired original fantasy world. It is the first book in an upcoming planned trilogy, and it's a lot of fun. It's also a wonderfully feminist book. You've got this big beefy Viking looking author writing big beefy Viking looking men in fantasy, and it's really feminist. Two of the protagonists, two of the three protagonists are women, and they are really good women. They are genuinely well-written women. I'm not trying to patronize John Gwynne, I'm just relieved. I'm thrilled that he's written such fantastic women characters in his book, especially because fantasy is changing. Fantasy literature these days is a little bit more dominated by women's voices, queer voices, black voices. It used to be a white male space, and it isn't so much anymore. And yet we've got a white male writing a fantasy novel, as is the status quo, and the women in it, sorry Bimini, sorry, the women in it are really great. I was thrilled, really fantastic. I've done a video on it, you can go watch that. This might be the most impactful book that I read this month. This is Things Remembered and Things Forgotten by Kyoko Nakajima. It's translated by two translators who share translation duty, Ian MacDonald and Ginny Taplitaki Mori. 
I'm a huge fan of Ginny Tapley Takimori, and I'm now a big fan of Ian MacDonald as well. There are 10 short stories in here. It is Japanese fiction, and Kyoko Nakajima is a wonderful Japanese author. As I said, this is a powerful collection of stories. It inspired me to write a video and an article listing some of my favorite Japanese short story collections, and this is now right at the top. These are stories that are inspired by time and space. It's not science fiction. It's just a collection that spreads itself across a recent generational timeline across the 20th and early 21st centuries. It looks at the effects of World War II. It looks at the Japanese economy and how Japan has changed over the last century, in some ways more dramatically than many countries have. It is incredible, the scope and scale of this book, considering how intimate it is, because every story looks at things like politics and economics, but it really does it from a very intimate space. This is about families. More than anything, this is about families and friends and loved ones. It is exploring marriages and brotherhood. It is beautiful. It's looking at lineage and family and love. It's really beautiful. The stories in here are gorgeous, they are expertly translated, and the two translators work together in such a fantastic way because you can't really tell who translated what. There is a symbiosis going on here that is just beautiful. I cannot recommend this enough. In fact, if I can only recommend one book from all of this, this entire video, let it be Things Remembered and Things Forgotten by Kyoko Nakajima. Another really, really fun book that came out this month and I couldn't resist picking up a copy is Circus of Wonders. Circus of Wonders is written by Elizabeth McNeil, who wrote The Doll Factory, which I still quite haven't found the time to read. I'm nearly there, maybe next month, we'll see. But The Doll Factory got a lot of attention. It won awards, I think, and my friend Callum loves it to pieces. And so I had to pick this up as soon as it came out in hardback because it's gorgeous and the book did not disappoint. You can go watch my video on it. I won't spend too much time on it because I think I'm waffling a little bit, but Circus Wonders is beautiful. Also, Elizabeth McNeil watched my video on it and that just made my day. As I mentioned when I talked about whatever I talked about, what was it again? Shadow of the Gods. When I talked about Shadow of the Gods, I mentioned that a lot of the books that we get are from indie presses, celebrating queer voices, voices in translation, etc, etc. This is exactly the kind of shit I'm talking about. 100 Boyfriends by Bronte Purnell. This is published by Cypher Press, who are a UK indie publisher who deal with queer voices and celebrating voices across the queer spectrum. Bronte Purnell is a gay black American writer who has written 25 punk short stories about gay love and gay sex. It is visceral, it is very, very darkly, bleakly funny. I laughed, I cried. Oh, it hits you hard, it really does. It hits you hard in a multitude of ways. The comedy comes at you from nowhere, and it's so dark you kind of feel guilty for laughing at the jokes. And then the emotional highs plummet to emotional lows, and they do not warn you ahead of time. There is a roller coaster ride here in this book, and I was gripped and sometimes didn't like being so gripped. It's a lot, it's a lot to take in. All the highs are high and the lows are low, and it really carries you through entire waves of relationships and romance and sexual encounters, the kinds of things that we can relate to and the kinds of things maybe we can't relate to. It's a real spectrum of emotions and experiences and everything. A Hundred Boyfriends is really, really important. I cannot thank Cypher Press enough for this. I featured this on a new article which I put my heart and soul into. I'm gonna link it in the description. I wrote this article on LGBTQ books from all around the world. I tried my best to include many different genders, sexualities, and different languages and cultures. And I had to include a few American writers and one of them was Bronte Purnell a really important gay black writer that you need to pay attention to. Here's a book that I didn't finish. I'm probably gonna do a whole video on the concept of not finishing books, because if you're not aware, I wasn't aware, in the insular world of book reading and talking about books online on Twitter and YouTube and stuff, there is a phrase called DNF. I didn't know what DNF was for ages, and then I was shocked and deflated and disappointed to find out it just stands for did not finish. And I was like, that's not, a thing? That's not a thing worth talking about, and the only reason we talk about it is because we've turned it into an acronym. It bugs me. It's very ordinary to put down books if you don't like them. It's not a hot take. 
It's not a thing we should discuss. If you're not enjoying a film, you turn it off. If you're not enjoying a 60 hour long video game, you stop at hour 20 and you don't feel bad. But for some reason in the book community, it's a hot topic talking about whether or not you DNF books. Of course I put books down if I don't like them. Jesus Christ, I only have so many minutes on this planet. Anyway, that's gonna be the topic of a video which I think I've already just spilled out onto the floor here. I didn't finish Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I still might. I'm not sure. I'm under 200 pages in, so I think that's nearly halfway. It's quite a chonky boy. I might finish it. I'm not sure. I like Lee Bardugo now. I watched Shadow and Bone. I read the first Shadow and Bone book. I enjoyed it. I really need some fun, simple, easygoing YA right now because I've read too much literary fiction lately and it does kind of cloud up my brain a bit. So I needed something a bit more chill, and I thought, well, I'll try Ninth House first before I go to her YA. I'll, I'll read her adult novel first. I just didn't really like it. There's nothing bad about it. I think we need to be aware as readers, as people who ingest any kind of media, fiction, stories, whatever, that there is a difference between things that you don't like and things that are bad. And Ninth House is not bad. Not bad at all. In fact, I can recognize that it's a pretty great novel. I just wasn't clicking with it myself, so that's on me. It's not on the book. I haven't finished it yet, I put it down and I read about five other books. I might go back to it. It's set at Yale, it's set at a university, it's dark academia about cults, it should be my bag, and for some reason, right now it just isn't. We'll see how we go. Speaking of, Shadow and Bone. I read Shadow and Bone. I watched the Netflix series, I really really enjoyed it, I read the first book, I've just started the second book, I'm like 30 pages in and it starts off on a ship, so yay, I love ships. This is really fun. It's not perfect, as I said in my video, and I had a lot of fun making it. The protagonists are dull as shit. The other characters are way more fun. The writing is surprisingly complex, and the world building is very, very competent and satisfying. I enjoyed it. There are problems. There are always problems with fantasy, especially YA fantasy, but I think this is one of the better ones. So if you haven't read Shadow and Bone, if you haven't watched the show, they are both worth your time. This is a book that will eventually go on a video sometime next month. It is in an article, which I'll link in the description. The article was originally written by a different writer for our website, but I have since added to it a little bit with books like this one, and I will turn that article into a video soon. This is The Story of a Goat. It's by Param Mal Murugan, who is a really famous contemporary Indian author. I thought, and I have mentioned this book briefly before in a video a while ago, I thought I'd never read any of his fiction before, but I actually have. I actually read and reviewed another one of his novels published by Pushkin Press, as this one is, probably two or three years ago now, and for some reason I completely forgot about it. It's called One Part Woman, and it's a really great novel. As soon as I reread my review, I was like, oh yeah, that was great. I just forgot it was that author. Perumal Murugan is really, really great. One Part Woman actually nearly ended his career. It's a very controversial novel in India, which I did a bit of research on and I was really surprised, but that's just my cultural ignorance. I now understand a little bit more why it was so controversial in India. It's a really great novel as is the story of a goat. I won't talk about it much here because a video is coming about some of my favorite Indian novels. Over the last year or two, I've read 10-ish probably Indian novels, contemporary Indian novels that have really, really hit me hard. And I wanna talk about them, I really do. Indian fiction is fantastic, I love it. And he's a really special writer. I'll talk a bit about it soon, so look out for that. But the story of a goat is great. And if you can just take me on my word, go check it out now. I finished this yesterday, it's good. This is To the Warm Horizon. It's by Choi Jin Young and it is translated by Soje. It's published by Honford Star. I've talked about Humford Star before. They are one of my favorite indie presses. I've already talked about how they were the first indie press that we ever worked with like three years back. When we were living in Korea, we got to know our friend Taylor, who's one of the people that runs Honford Star. Taylor's an awesome guy and he has hooked us up with so many great books. Honford Star are awesome. Please show them your love. They get the coolest cover designers. They almost always, or maybe always, get cover designers from the country that the book is from. They really dedicate themselves to doing everything right as a publisher. They name the translator on the cover. They get artists and designers from the country that the book is from. They do everything right. And everything that they publish always has lovely French flaps and really thick paper. Like these books feel meaty and good, like it's good quality. 
which is beside the point. To the Warm Horizon is a post-apocalyptic novel. It's Korean, it's set in Russia, and it feels very topical because it's an apocalypse that was caused by a very, very deadly virus that pretty much ravaged the entire planet in a really devastating way, and people started looting and running and killing and getting into gangs and all the stuff that you see in a post-apocalypse kind of a world. And it's set in Russia, and it's about two young women who meet each other while traveling across Russia from Korea trying to get somewhere, and one of them is a young woman who's lost both of her parents to the virus and she's looking after her deaf and mute little sister and the other woman is traveling with her big extended family in kind of a caravan situation. The two women meet and they fall in love. And this is a queer novel that is about love conquering all. It's very similar to Cormac McCarthy's The Road. It reminded me a little bit of the setting and tone of I Am Legend, the novel not the film, read the book, I Am Legend is really good, not the film. So it's got that post-apocalypse thing, that Mad Max but in the snow kind of a feel, but it's queer, it's a lesbian romance, and it is about love, it is about all these uh, post-apocalyptic dystopian trends that we've seen again and again and again, the setting, the events, the really, really crass and dark and raw things that happen that make you cringe and close your eyes and grasp at your pearls and say, oh, this is too much, but then there's love. And that makes it special, that makes it unique, makes it important. It's about love. And the last book that I read this month, other than the book that I am currently reading, is The Lamplighters by Emma Stonex. I just did a video on this with my friend Jen. Jen and I met up in Cambridge, we had a chat about the book. Jen also bought me this copy as well for my birthday, and we made a video together about our pros and cons and what we thought of The Lamplighters, so you can go watch that if you haven't already. It took quite a lot of editing, two people. Who would have thought? It's not impeccable. I think that it trips over its own feet a little bit, but it's a mystery novel set on a lighthouse and it flits between the 70s and the 90s and its biggest saving grace is its pacing. It has really fantastic pacing. It moves at a really nice steady click and it has a fantastic atmosphere where it feels very claustrophobic. You do get that claustrophobia that a lighthouse creates and that a surrounding ocean is going to create as well. It nails its atmosphere and it nails its pacing. The plot is not perfect, it is full of red herrings and loose threads, and that is a big problem. It's a deal breaker for a lot of people, especially if you're a huge fan of mystery fiction. It's definitely not the most competent mystery novel, but if you like the world and the characters and the setting and the atmosphere, and that's enough to carry you through, then I hugely recommend it because it was for me. And I'm increasingly becoming more of a mystery fan, and so I had to be pretty critical of the fact that it's not a perfect mystery. But it is pretty perfect when it comes to, as I say, its setting and its world. Just before I finish, I want to mention the fact that June is here, and although you can't tell from the weather outside because fuck the UK, I am very excited for what's coming out in June. June might be the best month of the year in terms of what releases are coming our way, especially in the world of translated fiction. I feel a little bit guilty because I spent a lot of May putting out videos and reading a lot of books that aren't translated fiction. I feel bad about that, but June, oh my god, June is an exciting one. There's a lot of great fiction coming out in June. My next video will be a rundown of all the best books coming out in June, so keep an eye. And subscribe for books.